there are people with exceptional talents. And so uh, it's very difficult to uh, make assessments about what is possible when you're dealing with that level of skill. Hmm. So I can believe the stories about St. Joseph. I'd like prefer to actually witness it, <laughs> but, and I could believe the stories about uh, uh, Daniel uh, Holm, the, the physical medium who was able to levitate and things like that. Uh, some people are really, really good. The Michael Jordans of the psychic world are exceptional. Hello, this is Dean Radin, and I'm on Your Superior Self. Mr. Radin, I cannot thank you enough for coming on the show. I'm kind of a fanboy. I really enjoy your work. Um, just got done reading your latest book, uh, Real Magic, Six and it is fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time. Happy to be here. So let's talk about how it started for you, right? Like, so now you are the uh, chief scientist for the IONS uh, Institute or the Institute of Noetic Sciences. Uh, but it didn't start out that way. I mean, you did uh, electrical engineering for your undergrad and uh, graduate degree, and then you, di you did a uh, PhD in psychology, which that's pretty interesting, right? Like, how do you go from electrical engineering to psychology? Well, it sounds a little unusual, but there's actually a discipline like engineering psychology is a thing mm -hmm. and human factors psychology or human factors engineering are things. So the, the, the uh, connection is, uh, or connections are people who are interested in technology, but primarily the human use of technology. Mm. So I've always been interested in both. Mm -hmm. And I think most people would recognize that when you, uh, whether you're using something as simple as a computer or something that is highly complex, uh, you wonder oftentimes why in the world did they make this interface so ridiculously complicated? Well, that's a human factors problem. Mm -hmm. and, and you see it everywhere. I mean, there's some places like people who make cars are very cognizant of that, but it hasn't always been that way. I mean, in the old days, practically every technology was made by and for engineers. As the technology has infiltrated the rest of society, there's more and more attention that's paid so that a piece of technology is usable by anybody. Sure. So that, that's what my, that, that was a connection for me, technology and human use. Hmm. Your story there growing up, like you were fascinated with like, uh, I think it was like um, self propulsion or rockets or something like that. And that kind of started you down a path of electrical engineering, um, user interface kind of, you know, psychology, electrical engineering, they definitely connect. Um, but how do you like, so now you, you're the lead scientist at, at IONS, like how, I mean, kind of direct me in that, in that path. Like, how did you get to where you're at today? Like, what was it? Was there a moment where like parapsychology, transpersonal psychology, psi, psychic um, abilities, like where did that interest start for you? I don't know. All I know <laughs> is that it has always been there. So one of the ways I, if I have to come up with a reason, I would guess that, uh, like a lot of kids, I read a ton of fairy tales, uh, a ton of science fiction, and a ton of comic books. And part of me was thinking, well, this, this is enjoyable. This is fun. Mm -hmm. uh, but another part of me was thinking, this seems more than simply fantasy. There, there's something else going on here that resonated with me. Mm. And so I never forgot that. And somewhere when I was around 12 years old or so, I discovered that there was a branch of science, which was looking into these kinds of phenomena and using the tools of science, which are pretty good, to see is this purely fantasy or is there really something going on? Because neither me or anyone in my family ever reported anything psychic. So I didn't have any personal experience to rely on. It was based purely on curiosity. Hmm. I love that. Because like, I think a lot of curiosity for me has driven me to like, you know, kind of, I mean, even out of my religious dogma, it has driven me out of that because I, 
I want to find out more about other areas like Psy, like remote viewing, like the things that you're studying. Um, it just, I don't know. The research, the data is, is supporting that these things, like you said, are genuine, right? Like these, these people that have these gifts, yeah, some of them show higher abilities than most. Um, it's kind of like I just got done reading the afterlife experiments with Dr. Gary Schwartz. I don't know if you read that or not, mm -hmm. um, but he, he compares to like, you know, a couple of psychics towards Michael Jordan, like Michael Jordan had like, I don't know. I mean, his shooting shooter rating rating was like 40%. And I mean, he took a, a thousand shots. I mean, it was unbelievable. But if you're a psychic hitting like 40% of like, you know, accurate readings, I mean, that's huge, right? Like, I mean, you've done a lot of um, research with psychics and their abilities, what is some of the most fascinating data that you've um, come up with? Well, I have worked with some people who are very talented, but I think what's even more interesting than that is that the vast majority of subjects and experiments were not selected because they had talent. They're usually selected either because they were available, like they, they have 20 minutes or an hour to spare, mm. Mm. Uh, or their college sophomores doing it because they want credit for their psychology course, or they just had an, an interest. Mm -hmm. And so what's interesting then is that uh, the experiments overall show that they're, that basically the majority of people have some ability, whether they realize it or not. So we're talking about a, a fundamental ability of human beings. Now that said, Yes, there are some people who have high talent, just as there is in music and sports. And there's some people who have what you can almost think of it as an anti-talent. They have no musical ability at all. They have no sports ability at all. And they have no psychic ability at all. So it helps if you want to get an experiment that's more easily repeatable to select people based on their actual performance, just as you would do for anything else. You know, you want, you want to go for talent, but it turns out you don't really have to. It, it's important. I mean, the analogy here is that let's say you wanted to uh, test how people could, how high people could jump. So you can pick random people off the street and find out that the average person can jump maybe three feet from a, from a standing start, three feet high. Uh, and if they maybe they run up to it, maybe four feet, that that's, probably pushing it, but the, the world record is eight feet. Well, you don't run across too many people who can jump eight feet with a running start, but that's the record. So the same is true in this domain. If you want to do something which is truly remarkable, you find people who are really, really good at it. But again, uh, the, one of the reasons that a lot of the scientific tests don't use those people is because A, they're hard to find, they're, they're relatively rare, mm -hmm. uh, and B, we want to know what's true in general, not, not what's true at the extremes. And so, and which is true of a lot of the way the psychological tests are done. We want to know what, what's true about being a human being as opposed to what's true about Olympic champions. Yeah. Now, you did a lot of fascinating work with, with random number generators, right? Like back in the day with, uh, I, you know, trying to see if we can influence physical matter, right? Yep. Like, I guess our intuition or like energy. Um, can you, can you talk about those experiments a little bit? Yeah. So here's one. So th this is one made by a company in Geneva. Uh, it's, it's called a quantum random number generator because the way it works is uh, the single photons are shot through it and it reaches a half silvered mirror. And uh, when a photon hits a mirror, half silvered, it will either go through or it'll bounce off. And what, which one of those that it does is considered to be fundamentally random. Like we, there's no way to know in advance what it's going to do. So you can turn that into random bits. And there are a number of other methods that can be used for the same thing. So the reason why random number generators and in earlier days, things like tossing of dice was useful as a target is because it is thought that the amount of energy or force required in order to make something go through or bounce off a mirror would be extremely small. And so it's, it, it's a way of measuring tiny bits of force because early on it was thought that these kinds of abilities probably were mediated 
by force. Nevertheless, random number generators have been a target used for about 50 years in the laboratory, DICE about 50 years before that. And the overall data shows, at least to my satisfaction and to many of my colleagues, that what seems to be happening is that uh, focused intention changes the probability of individual events. So you, you see that then as you're pushing out a stream of, of zeros and ones randomly, and you tell somebody to make it push out more ones or more zeros, and that's what it does. <laughs> but you did like, I think it was like, you got like turned on a couple of them around the area, like during the OJ Simpson trial. Um, I think these things have been taken to like sacred locations around the world, like just the energy around like the pyramids and I don't know about Jer Jerusalem or, or whatever, but these areas and these, um, these happenings in human existence, like the OJ Simpson trial was huge. Like everybody was watching it. Right. And, and people were getting triggered and people were like in it involved in flow. And these, these random number generators were showing, um, uh, you know, not going, you know, entirely with chance. It wasn't just 50%. Like they were shooting out ones and zeros, like um, in different directions, right? Yeah. So you're talking about a slightly different use of the random number generators. So the studies that are done in the laboratory, generally we're looking at the role of intention, but intention also includes attention, right? You can't intend without having some, some attention. Mm -hmm. So uh, my colleague, Roger Nelson, uh, who was at Princeton for many years, uh, working at the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab, uh, he decided to see whether the act of attention alone would influence the, the randomness. And so uh, what he did would, would take it to meditations and musical performances and things of that sort and have the random number generator going, but not tell anybody that they were in an experiment. It would just have it there. And the idea, this is called a, an experiment in field consciousness, because the idea was that uh, maybe there's something about focused attention, which would cause randomness to behave less random. And so the random number generators used for that purpose, uh, he found that in many contexts it did do that. Uh, so I started doing the experiments as well. That's why in one book I talk about the OJ Simpson test. And then uh, in 1998, we decided to, rather than uh, just run our generators during some event, to have it run continuously, many generators around the world. And so that was called the Global Consciousness Project. It started in 1998, and it's still running. And at the, its peak, we had about 75 generators running in major cities around the world. And what we would do in that, that context was we would uh, either plan in advance because we knew that something was coming up like the opening ceremony of the Olympics or something where we could predict that there were tens to hundreds of millions or even more people all attending to the same thing at the same time through the media, or there'd be something like a terrorist attack which would draw a lot of people's attention afterwards. So in all cases, you have these large scale world events uh, we would note the event and, and say, well, we think this event is like four hours or six hours or eight hours. We define that up front. Then we'd pull the data off of the random network. And we'd do a standardized analysis to see whether or not the worldwide network of random generators was acting according to chance or not. And after 500 such events, it took like 15 years to get that many events, sure. Uh, after 500 events, the overall uh, odds against chance was 3 trillion to 1. True. So what that means is that each one of these little these 500 events showed a small effect, but more or less in the same direction. And after adding up all 500, you, you get very strong statistical evidence that the network was not behaving randomly during those events, those big events. <laughs> Like what, what's the underlying mechanism that would connect large scale human attention and changes in physical randomness? Hmm. And I wish I could tell you the answer, but we don't know what that answer is. Yet. <laughs> All I can do is give you metaphors. Sure. Sure. Um, 
it's just all oh, your work is just so fascinating. I mean, I can't imagine, you know, what do you guys do when you go, when you come to work? Like, I assume, I, I don't know, I guess, like, since you're the lead scientist, do you guys come in? Like, I mean, I'm assuming you're working virtual now. What, what is your typical day? Like, do you guys just come in and say, all right, what are we studying? Where do we need to go? We're, we're trying to tackle consciousness. Like, what is, what does a typical day look like at, at your institute? Well, we, we have a weekly meeting. Uh, at the meeting, we talk about projects that are underway. I have about eight projects that are in various stages of development. Uh, if somebody comes up with a new idea, they want to float and see what the others think about it. That's, that's what we talk about. Um, each of us comes from a slightly different background. So we have different interests ranging from molecular biology to neuroscience, to physics, to a wide range of things. Um, so we, we will then select, uh, based on our, our interests individually and as a group, what do we want to pursue? So an, an experiment could easily take two years, sometimes mm. three years to finish. So the, that's why we have many, many different experiments, ideas, some are on paper, some are active, uh, and they're all at different stages. Sometimes, like I have lots of ideas, but I can't do them all because I'm one person, but also because uh, we need to raise funds to support the project. And sometimes that's a limiting factor. Can you talk about what you're working on right now that fires you up? Like, is there something that you're working on currently that is just, you know, so exciting, you know, raises everyone's curiosity? Well, so we, we just finished. By finishing a project, I mean that we're, uh, we either have published a paper which describes it or the, pub the publication is close to being published. So one, one such example, and this started uh, almost four years ago, from the idea to the experiments to finally publishing it, we used a type of target in mind-matter interaction that had not been used before. So any form of mind-matter mind -matter interaction involves some form of mind, some form of matter, but they're not connected. It's not like inside your head, it's mind influencing something at a distance. So you can think of the mind side of this equation as non-local mind, because the, the hypothesis is that my mind could influence something over there. So somehow my mind has to get over there, non-local mind. When you look at the history of the kinds of things that have been influenced, the targets, the matter targets are all always localized, meaning that you're trying to influence a die or even a random number generator, or a cell culture, or something. It's like a self-contained thing. So we decided, uh, based on the evidence from many different kinds of experiments, it's pretty clear that the mind can push around the physical world at many different scales, from photons to human behavior, and maybe even globally. So we wanted to try a different target, a non-local matter target. So we could look at the relationship between non-local mind and non-local matter. What I mean by that is, uh, this, by the way, it wouldn't make any sense at all 100 years ago because it wasn't anything thought to be non-local matter. I'm talking about entangled photons. Mm -hmm. So our target in this case was entangled photons. And when talking about entanglement, the entanglement is not an all or none thing. It's a spectrum of entanglement. Entanglement is talking about correlations between the behavior of separated objects. So instruments have been developed that will sit on your tabletop, uh, which allow you to produce about a thousand entangled photons per second. So we have one of those. Hmm. We also got one for a colleague in France so we could do simultaneous experiments in two different laboratories. We present to the subjects in the experiment an ongoing graph of the degree of entanglement strength ongoing uh, and give instructions to look at the graph and make the line go up on the graph. Well, if that was happening, it means that the, it means that the entanglement strength was going up. So the point of the experiment is, can the mind modulate entanglement strength? So we did four experiments in a laboratory. We did one experiment online. The, the short answer is, yes, the mind can modulate entanglement strength. So this is important, not only because it's interesting, uh, but because it is relevant to our understanding of quantum mechanics. What I mean is, 
that entanglement as described by quantum mechanics, it cannot, has an upper limit to the degree to which things can be entangled. So you wouldn't normally ordinarily think about such things, but you have two particles, which if, uh, if they're not sufficiently entangled, they're falling into classical particles. They're completely separate. When they become entangled, they're not quite separate anymore. They're, they're entangled in some way that is described as superpositions. But that degree of entanglement only can go up to a certain degree. So it's called a Cyrelson bounds, named after this Russian guy named Cyrelson. So what we wanted to see is, could you modulate entanglement strength above the Cyrelson bound? Because if you can, it means that we need to, to revise quantum mechanics which is incredibly accurate, hmm. but may not actually hold when you bring consciousness to bear onto hmm. matter. So in this experiment, we weren't able to do that. But what we were able to do is show, not only can we modulate the degree of entanglement, we were able to show that the magnitude of the effect that we're getting is in principle large enough. Like we're getting enough modulation so that with additional experiments, maybe by selecting people to do the experiment, with better devices, we might actually be able to push the entanglement strength above the Cyrelson bound, which would provide evidence that we need a super quantum theory with, uh, whenever we're dealing with, with aspects of human consciousness. Wow. So the other reason why this is interesting is because when you look at the, the whole range of quantum technologies, we're talking about quantum computing, entanglement, uh, uh, teleportation, uh, encryption and a bunch of other methods. So these are all uses of quantum entanglement. The, the, the hard problem in doing these kinds of technologies is to maintain the entanglement itself. It's, it's, it's relatively fragile and it's easy for it to break, in which case you can't do the technology. So a lot of effort is taken to maintain the, the quantum coherence, which is related to the entanglement. Well, as it turns out that uh, when people focus their attention towards the entanglement system, all, the only effect that we were able to see was an, in, an increase in the fidelity of the entanglement, the strength increased. We also did experiments where we tried to see if the mind could decrease the entanglement, and we, we saw no evidence of that. Mm -hmm. So what this suggests is that in the future, when we better understand what's going on here, there may be an, a way or an aspect in which human consciousness plays a role in future quantum technologies. Because if my mind can cause entanglement fidelity to increase, which is what we want it to do, well, if I have a, a quantum computer sitting in front of me and I'm thinking intently about it, it might actually work better than if I'm not thinking about it at all. Or the other way of thinking of it is that maybe all of the quantum technologies that are being used out there are responsive to human attention. In which case, if you're using a quantum cryptography uh, method to make sure you have a, 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 a communication channel that is secure, maybe it's not so secure if you have somebody trying to jam it mentally. Now, I don't think that you'd be able to, at this point, I don't think you'd be able to, uh, to tap into the channel to figure out what was going on, but you might be able to reduce its effectiveness. Yeah. I wonder when the paradigm is going to shift, right? Like I, I had a conversation with Bruce Lipton and we talked about quantum, everything, quantum biology, quantum mathematics, quantum psychology. He has a pyramid that builds upon it, right? Like the foundation is quantum mechanics. <clears throat> I mean, when do you think we'll, you know, as a society, as a, as a, I don't know, as, as a, humans like change this the, the paradigm of science like there's a lot of data out there that is that supports you know consciousness comes before space and time right like you said it when do you think that we're gonna catch the idea of we need to change everything we've been teaching well we're in the midst of it now yeah yeah i mean the paradigm change does not happen overnight it, it happens in a couple of generations because the, the, whoever is holding the status quo is not going to change. That's the whole point of the status quo is not to change. Uh, a slightly younger generation, the one before that, is open, more open to the idea, but it's the one after that that begins to 
uh, that grows up with new ideas and they don't see it as threatening. Sure. So we're talking about at least three generations. That means we're talking about 50 to 60 years before new ideas come, come to pass. And so the reason why I, I say that we're in the midst of it now is because as I write in my book, in, in Real Magic, that uh, thought leaders, like open-minded thought leaders today are talking about panpsychism, about neutral monism, about consciousness is fundamental, all of that. This is new. This is like within the 20 or 30 years ago, you wouldn't find anybody talking about this except maybe a couple of philosophers. But now we're talking about neuroscientists and physicists who are talking about it. Yeah. That's, that's an indicator that a paradigm shift is underway. I can't wait um, because I just feel, uh, I mean, I'm going back to school now for psychology, which leads me up to my next question is like, <laughs> what does one have to do? Like, what would you recommend somebody who wants to follow in your footsteps that wants to study psi, that wants to get into studying consciousness, you know, work with, let's say an organization like ions, like, what would you recommend their pathway be like coming out of school? Like, where do they need to go? What do they need to study? Who did they, who do they need to hang out with? Well, in terms of school, you should uh, learn everything you possibly can in every domain. <laughs> so that means uh, whether, if you can, that uh, any kind of scientific uh, curriculum uh, in, in any kind of science also take uh, philosophy of science and also take sociology of science because you learn very quickly in those domains that what you're learning is based on a set of assumptions. It's materialism. But most scientists don't take philosophy courses because they think it's irrelevant. A lot mm -hmm. of scientists think that philosophy is relevant, but they're wrong because every, everything that we do within science, our, our methods are based on a set of assumptions and some of them are wrong. Some of them are always wrong. Yeah. So you at least need to understand what the assumptions are in order to be able to begin to identify which ones don't seem to be working very well. So, so that's part of it. Uh, so it's, it's, appreciating uh, that philosophy actually does have something to offer. And, and as well as sociology, because you learn very quickly that when you start bumping up against the status quo, you will be labeled a heretic. This is, I mean, the whole history of science is based on this. So you need to also understand then that if you're, if you're studying something which is considered to be controversial, you can have arrows shot at you and you have to be prepared for that and simply know that that's, that's something that happens. So beyond that, you then uh, find that there's a couple of professional societies in the world. Uh, the Parapsychological Association is one. The Society for Scientific Exploration is another. Uh, there are equivalents in the UK. You, in the old days, meaning pre-pandemic, you would go to those annual conferences and meet people and if you're uh, very ambitious, you start doing experiments and you give presentations at those conferences, because among other things, it tells people, the few people who actually are at places where there are jobs for this sort of thing, it says, oh, this person is really serious about this. They're doing work. And if you're really lucky, doing good work uh, that causes others to pay attention. Sure. That's how you do it in any field. But in particularly in this one, because the number of jobs available, like paying jobs, maybe there's five in the world. It's crazy. So, yeah. So, so part of it is part of the way that I described it is, you know, how do how do you how do you get a job if you really wanted to do this full time? Uh, you have to perform a miracle, right? So part of it is. Like, like anytime you decide you're thinking about what am I passionate about? What do I really want to do? You craft a way to do it. And it may take 10 years or 20 years to figure out a way of doing it. You have to be flexible. You have to be extremely competent. You have to meet the right people. This is, this is not a secret. I mean, this is how it's, it's true in every, every endeavor that anybody ever does. You figure out what do I, where do I need to be? What do I need to do? in order to get the attention of people who can give me a job to do what I want to do. Sure. So I spent, I don't know, I spent maybe 10 years 
seeing what was necessary in order to be able to do this, like be positioned in the right place and time. Well, so it, it works. Well, I'm, I'm also interested in like what you're studying and researching now with like pe- one's goals, like, you know, where do I want to go? Cause like what the data you're like uncovering, like just with your intention experiments with your, uh, you know, using my mind to influence photons, like, can I, with my mind will the thing that I want, or, or how should I say this? you know, bring into my reality, the goal that I want, right? Like, I don't know if you want to call it law of attraction or whatever. I don't, I think that's a little, I don't know, maybe that's what it's called, but I mean, being able to create my reality the way, not necessarily like a, you know, uh, not earning it, but like working towards something. Like if I have a goal, like 10 year goal, and I see myself in this and I envision myself in it, and I just put all my attention to that, you know, what are the probabilities that this thing's going to happen? And I think a lot of the research, I mean, if we can influence matter, how come we can't influence our reality? Well, we can. So (laughs) you're saying, uh, what, what what is the probability if you attempt to, to intentionally manifest your future? And what I can say then is with pretty high certainty that it's a lot better than if you were not trying to influence it, (laughs) whether it's a hundred percent, is another issue Mm -hmm. because anytime you try to influence anything in the world, whether it's simply a a die that's falling or another person's behavior or whatever it happens to be, you're pushing against the entire universe. So the universe might say, no, you you don't get to do this. So a lot depends on the nature of the goal. So the one way I describe this sometimes is uh, let's say I want to have a gold plated Mercedes. And I don't want to actually work for it. I just, I just wish that I, I think that's what I want. I want a gold-plated Mercedes. Well, the probability of having one show up on your doorstep is actually increased by virtue of that want. On the other hand, think of what needs to happen in the rest of the world in order for that to occur. All kinds of very, very unlikely things. So the probability will increase. It probably is not going to increase to the point where you're actually going to get exactly what you want. On the other hand, a person who heard me say this one time uh, sent me this, a (laughs) gold-plated Mercedes. It actually is a gold-plated Mercedes. It may not be gold, but it's a gold color. And so what she said was, you know, uh, sometimes you, you will manifest what you want. It may not be exactly what you wanted, but it could be close. That's So I wasn't asking for this, but this is the perfect example of how, uh, how your ability to set goals will certainly tweak your psychology. So this has nothing to do with psychic anything. Mm-hmm. It's simply that every time you have a goal, you're changing what the, the way that the, you're looking at the world and adjusting your behavior uh, accordingly. So you add on to that possible psychic synchronicities and things of that sort. And if you end up being in the right place at the right time, and that is what you want to do, mm-hmm. you'll recognize it and you'll follow it. Sure. I think there's a part in your book that I remember reading where you were moving into a new building or something and you walked into the neighbor neighbor office or something. You walked in, the guy like freaked out. Yeah. Because he said that he had tried, he manifested that. Can you talk about that? He wanted to manifest me. <laughs> yeah. He wanted me to show up and he had no idea where I was or how to contact me, but he wanted me to show up to be on his board of advisors because he was doing work similar to what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And we just happened synchronistically be adjacent to each other in this office space where neither of us had any idea before we actually met. That is nuts. Like what would you like when he said that to you, what were your thoughts? Like this guy's crazy. I felt very disoriented. Yeah, because we we all walk around thinking that we have free will. So I thought I had free will walking over and introducing myself, but that's what he wanted me to do. So did I really have free will or was that an illusion? I don't know. He was specifically doing an exercise to manifest me. Really? So, yeah, I mean, have you ever tried that? Have you ever tried that in a laboratory? Like, have you guys with law of attraction and manifestation, have you guys researched any of that? Not in so many terms. 
right? So he, he was doing a Tibetan dream yoga exercise, mm-hmm. and I've never had the patience to do that. <laughs> but when we, anytime we do an experiment in a lab where we're asking somebody to use their intention, so typically to change the behavior of some kind of instrument, that's a miniature version of, of manifesting. Sure. Right. So when you're manifesting real world effects, like getting a job or something, it's, it's more difficult to measure. Is there really a change given how, how, I mean, if you're really lucky, you'll end up with exactly the thing that you had in mind. Mm -hmm. And that does happen occasionally. More often, you're going to end up with something which is kind of in that direction. So is that chance or not? Well, you can't tell in the real world, but you can in the laboratory. How is your studies, how has your data, how has your work, like, I mean, from where you started out, like your, I don't know, let's say your, 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 I don't know, uh, spirituality, like, how has it changed it? Has it changed it at all? Like, do you, has the science, has the data influenced your beliefs about the life after? Well, those are two very different questions. (laughs) So I, I was not raised, raised in a religious sense at all, Mm -hmm. purely agnostic, not atheistic, but agnostic uh, in the sense that it, it was like a topic that never came up and we were never taught anything about it. So didn't know. And I remain agnostic. I'm not smart enough to know what, what's going on at, at such mm-hmm. deep levels. I would say though that uh, I would probably fall into the class, which is the largest growing class of beliefs today with, with uh, quasi-religious beliefs of being spiritual, but not religious. Hmm. So any religion that claims to know the answer, I don't buy it because sure. I, as, uh, this is partially simply about being a scientist that I don't accept things on faith. I'm an empiricist and I, I need to test it myself in order to be convinced. So I know people who are profoundly religious, and the reason that they are is because they did do something. Something happened to them that they would call a religious epiphany, and they become extremely religious. And I, I, I can buy that, right? Something happened to them. Well, it's never happened to me, so I, I don't see any reason to, to collapse my belief system into a particular religion. And so- I'm not even sure that one episode would convince me either. But the second part of your question was about the afterlife. So I'm agnostic where it comes there as well. And so uh, you mentioned Gary Schwartz. Gary Schwartz has very strong opinions about the afterlife, as many people do. My sense is that, and this is a debate that's been going on since the late 1800s, do we have evidence, like proof positive evidence, that there is survival of consciousness after bodily death? And I would say no, and be partially in principle, because you can't know whether consciousness survives if you don't know what consciousness is. And second, virtually every form of evidence for consciousness surviving is said or provided by living people. <laughs> we don't have any independent evidence from dead people. And as a result, it becomes, uh, you can describe this as the question of does consciousness survive bodily death? That's a category mistake. That's what a philosopher would say is a category mistake. It's like saying, what is the square root of an orange? Yeah. Like that's not a valid question. You can't answer that question because the the most important element of it is somebody who is dead can tell you the answer. Well, it's not dear death, right? Because that's near death. It's not death. And there is no other form of evidence that's available other than what living people say. So this is a problem. Now, Gary Schwartz would say uh, that you can make a case based on the, either the preponderance of the evidence or proof beyond a reasonable doubt. I don't buy it because I've worked enough with people who are very talented clairvoyants that uh, somebody could say, uh, well, how would you possibly explain how a medium working with a proxy sitter could get accurate information. So you, you know what a proxy sitter design is? I've read some of Gary's stuff, um, but a proxy sitter is like somebody who um, you, like nobody knows who that person is, right? No, no information, no background, no talking, no, nothing like that, right? They just come in, they sit. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. So, so they are a proxy 
for a person who wants to contact a departed loved one, right? So if you're a medium and I'm the proxy sitter, I have no idea who this, what the sitter wants to know. I don't even know the sitter. So the only reason I'm in front of you is because as a medium, you might find it easier to talk to somebody, even though I know nothing mm -hmm. about what's going on. So in proxy sitter situations where it could be double or triple blind, the medium has no way to get information from me by asking or cold reading or body language or anything about the departed loved one of somebody else. And yet they can do that. And so somebody could say to them, well, how in the world can a medium get information from a, a departed person if it wasn't a departed person? Because it's not telepathy. I don't know what the answer is. You don't know who the sitter is. That sounds impossible. And I say, yeah, it would seem impossible if you're not familiar with what good clairvoyance can do. Because a clairvoyant, especially like I'm familiar with the military program, you can give somebody a random series of numbers which corresponds to some target out in the world. And the clairvoyant can tell you all kinds of things about that place. They have no idea what it is other than these numbers. Mm -hmm. Well, if a clairvoyant can do that with information in the world that is checkable, well, why can't a medium do that? Maybe it's the same underlying process. It does not require that there be a departed person telling you the answer. So as I said, this debate has been going on for a very long time because we run up against a epistemological confound. Our methods of studying the phenomenon is not able to cleanly distinguish between departed people and skills in the living. It's simply not. And so that's why I remain agnostic. I think like a lot of people, I would like to think sure. that we persist in some form, but I don't see a way of getting a clean answer. Um, you make very valid points. Um, I tell you what really um, influenced me was even Alexander, his story. I don't know if you did you read his book? Yeah, I, I know even um, where he had a near death experience. And he's a you know, uh, he, he's, a, he's a surgeon, he works on, um, you know, he's a neur neural surgeon, right? Like he works on the brain. And so yeah. when he came back, he was able to look at all the paperwork and all the, all the medical records and be like, and ba basically say, um, you know, there's no, there's no way I should be here. Right. Like there's, and to be able to be looking at these photos and looking at the, the information and actually having cognitive processes right now is just outstanding. Uh, his story to me, like you're just, like you were talking about earlier, like that's his experience, right? Um, you said that you haven't had an experience, but his, his experience and the information that he was able to retrieve while he was in that coma. I mean, obviously we will never be able to explain it, right? That's, it's a part of consciousness that, you know, I've never experienced It's a part of consciousness that I'll never understand, but his, his story, like it really made me think about like, you know, what are we really like? What is reality, right? Like the double slit, um, test or the, the intelligent observer, like when I turn around and you know, is the reality behind me actually there? You know, like Einstein said, you know, I like to think that the moon's still there when I'm not, even when I'm not looking at it, you know, that th these types of stories, even like Anita Morjani, like they just blow my mind because it's like, they go into a different, you know, different level of consciousness that I haven't experienced yet. Maybe I have, and maybe dreams, but like, you know, to be in a coma and come out and have these experiences and be able to heal themselves from their, um, you know, diseases or cancer or anything like that. Um, have you studied anything like, like Eben or Anita's case, like, um, people that have had near death experiences and, you know, what type of brain waves or anything like that? Yes. And so and the way you described Eben's experience had an assumption, you made an assumption when you were describing it, you <laughs> said the experience he had while he was in coma. Yeah. There is no evidence that that is the case. There's no evidence in any case of near-death experience that the experience that is later reported took place while the person was clinically dead or in coma. None. So th the reason why there too there's a confound is because we know there's precognition, mm -hmm. right? So clairvoyance is not locked in space or time. And one thing else that we know is that uh, clairvoyance and any kind of psychic phenomenon is significantly better in non-ordinary states of awareness. 
So think about the non-ordinary, non-ordinary state when you're in the process of dying or the process of being resuscitated. The brain is working. You're in some kind of a very weird state, which is not a dream. It's not all kinds of things. Because we know that the living can experience things that are not in time, not in clock time. And because we know that dreams can be very, very short, but feel like they go on forever. Then the confound is that maybe all of the experiences of even and any, anyone else who describes their near-death experience took place in a flash as they were dying or being, being resuscitated. Because when they are dead, you cannot tell if they're actually there or not. So most people assume that a near-death experience is like proof positive. They were dead. They saw something happening. They had this experience. I would say, no, you analyze that in detail. You cannot know if that's when the experience actually occurred. And you probably shoot this down too. Uh, what about the where they state that they have like the over the, the over the body, like visualizations and like hearing conversations about you know, outside of the room of like the doctors and stuff like that. People have out-of-body experiences when they're nowhere near death, it's just have you, spontaneously. Have you ever had one, an out-of-body no. experience? Have you studied no. anyone with, that claims they've had them? I've, I've talked to people who've had, yeah. yeah. I mean, they're like, you go to the Monroe Institute and take whole courses to learn how to do that. Have you been there yet? I, I want to go there so bad. <clears throat> I, I have been there and I've taken their, their gateway program, which is the, the first program that you do. Sure. Yeah. No, it's it's a very powerful method. Did you experience I, I never anything? felt that I was separating from my body, but I can see how uh, under the right circumstances, yeah, it, it could happen. Like, what do you experience when you go through the gateway? Like, what did you personally experience? Well, we, we listened to the uh, hemisync uh, sounds while waking up and then for about six hours actively during the day and then while going to sleep. So maybe a total of seven, eight, or nine hours a day for six days in a row. You were very, very altered by the end of that. So the story I tell then is the instructor said at the very beginning that you're going to end up being very altered. You may not feel that you're altered because it's a retreat, right? You don't, you don't have to do anything. You're just doing the, the workshop. So... Uh, the, the caution was that if you have driven yourself here, you may not want to drive home because you don't know how altered you are. And I was thinking, yeah, sure. So I didn't feel altered, but I, I got home somehow. I had to drive about seven, eight miles through backwoods things and then through a city and so on. I don't actually remember how I got home. <laughs> the, the one thing I do remember is that it was time to go. And then the next thing I remember, I was in the car waiting at a stoplight, and the stoplight was red. I'm in the middle of town. And I remember looking at that light and thinking, this is the best looking red I have ever seen. A little bit like you're high on pot, and you're just, the the beauty of the redness is just overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And then it changed to green, and I had no idea what to do. Because now I was fully engaged in the beauty of the green. So finally, somebody beeped, and I, it kind of brought me to awareness of what, what. And I saw a car going, oh, that's right. You're supposed to go now. The next thing I know, I'm home. <laughs> and then years later, I mentioned this to somebody at, to, who was also at the workshop, and she had asked me at the workshop if I could drop her off at the bus station. So apparently, I said, okay. And I did drop her off. I have no memory of any of that. Wow. So, so, so can't, I mean, and... This was just six days of listening to these, this hemisync tape. So you can imagine 10-day meditation retreats, longer retreats, people going for a month and so on. Your perception of reality is very, very different. Mm -hmm. Have you read his books, uh, Robert Monroe's books? I have. I, I keep rereading the third one. I, I love, absolutely love Ultimate Journey. Um, I love the audible version of that too. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Like, I just, I have like the more that I like, you know, the more that I progress on my path, like the more, like the book never changes, but I keep changing. Right. Every time I go back and read it, like I'm at the part now where he's talking about the highway. I can never understand what he meant by the highway. 
And now that I, you know, start reading a lot of different things and, you know, he's talking about the soul, right? The soul is a highway and every exit ramp is like his, his life, right? Like this mm -hmm. Trey Downs is the exit on into local town or whatever with stoplights. Like what was your, what were your thoughts on that book? It's, it's similar to like reading uh, Eben Alexander's experiences mm -hmm. or other people who have near death experiences that the, the, the size of inner space is immense. What we can actually experience inside is so broad that uh, it, it's it probably should not put any limits on it at all. But when I put on my science hat, I'm thinking, how do we explain that? Because when you think about uh, any experience that you're having, it's a construction of the mind and brain are, are constantly constructing everything out there. We know that through lots of studies in psychology, including things like illusions and so on, it's very easy to fool the brain into perceiving something that isn't there. Well, this is true all the time. We're always constructing what's out there. So if this is happening at a conscious level, you can imagine the range that can go on in an unconscious level. So because I have a naturally skeptical about basically everything, it's mm -hmm. part of being a scientist, you know, you want to test things. Just because somebody has an extraordinary experience is interesting, pay a lot of attention to it. Those experiences, after all, are the basis for the kinds of experiments that we do. But if there's no way to actually experiment with the experiences to vet what is going on, then I leave it in the category of experience. For the person who has the experience, it is overwhelmingly, you have to accept it because otherwise you go crazy. Yeah. So I'm completely sympathetic to people who have those experiences and that shapes their worldview. But until I can figure out a way of testing it in some way or, or even just personally experiencing it, it stays as a story. Sure. Well, I'll tell you what story I loved. I loved your book, um, Real Magic. It's, it's, it's it's a fun read for me. Um, I, I'm very much into the, the you know the data that you you have that supports you know a, a lot of the experiments they were doing, and I, I know the one thing that I really I I guess towards the end of the back you start talking about like um, what was it the flying what was it the 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 guy who was flying around he's like um, um Saint Joseph yeah Saint Joseph. I, I just love those stories, man. Cause it's like, I don't know. It's just like, is it possible? Like, do people have these type of, you know, genuine abilities to be able to do these things, right? Like you talked about a modern guy, what was it like 1930s or something like that, where a guy like predicted like UFO sightings in, in California. Yeah. Even right? more recently, I think he was in the 1960s, 1960s. Yeah. Like, to think about that. What, what were your thoughts on that? Like there are people with exceptional talents. And so uh, it's very difficult to uh, make assessments about what is possible when you're dealing with that level of skill. Mm. So I can believe the stories about St. Joseph. I'd like prefer to actually witness it. <laughs> but, and I could believe the stories about uh, uh, Daniel uh, Holm, the, the physical medium who was able to levitate and things like that. Uh, some people are really, really good. The Michael Jordans of the psychic world are exceptional. So that's, I think, useful for us to, to see what, like, what, what are the limits? Like, I don't know that there are any limits actually, but there's some remarkable things going on. Uh, my psychology side is thinking, I would rather know, since I don't have those skills, what can I do? What could the average person do? Sure. And, and then it becomes more meaningful to me because I don't think I'm gonna levitate. You know, I, I, I can't draw down the UFOs. I don't know how to do any of this stuff. So it's interesting as a story, but I, I'm more interested in figuring out what, what can the average person do like me, right? I'm not particularly psychically talented, although I, I can get results in experiments, but so can a lot of people. Sure. Sure. Oh, man, I love talking to you. Um, <clears throat> where can people find out more about you? Well, they can go to deanradin.com, which is my personal website, or they can go to noetic.org, which is where I work, or you can go to cognogenics.io, 
which is a company that uh, I'm the chairman of, it's a biotech company. Uh, and with any luck, in perhaps a year or so, uh, you will find my name as one of the writers on a TV series. Uh -oh. I, I wrote a science fiction TV series, which was designed to put a very different kind of spin on uh, television and movies that have psychic components. Hmm. Because if you look through the long, long list, most of them devolve very quickly into horror. And they, they, it basically gives a bad name to, to these kinds of phenomena. So this is a series where psychic phenomena play a central role, but in a positive way. Is that going to be on like Netflix or where's that going to be at? Well, I hope so. Yeah. So it, it's being shopped to streaming services now. Oh yeah. And uh, I, I don't know too many actors, but one that I know is quite famous. And so I pitched it to him to see if he'd be willing to play the protagonist. Mm -hmm. And he said, yes. So when you attach an actor to sure. a series, a TV series, it makes it much more likely that somebody's going to buy it. That's awesome. So, I, I, I intend intention. I'm sending some intentions your way. I hope that that works out because that'd oh, be fascinating. Yeah. Dean Raiden, thank you so much for joining the show. This has been amazing. I can't thank you enough. Um, you're always welcome to come back. Mm -hmm.